Hey everyone, what's going on? In the brand new studio, coming to you live, we finally have an easy process to do these live streams. So one of the things I'd love to hear from you in the comments is, do you find these live streams valuable? It gives you a format where you can ask questions and I can give you answers to the extent that I know the answers. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you. So if you'd let me know in the comments, that would be fantastic. So the other day, I saw an article and I've, I've been wanting to do a live stream on this for a while because overpayments is, is a subject that I, I talk about pretty often. Um, maybe not on the channel, but, but uh, in my blog, you'll often see references to overpayments when I'm talking about the earnings limit or I'm talking about the windfall elimination provision or I'm talking about some of these other things. You don't want to run afoul of an overpayment. I've heard of some cases that three, four, five, up to 10 years later, an individual will receive an overpayment notice from the Social Security Administration, alleging that they've been overpaid. And those things are almost impossible to unravel. Very, very difficult to figure out what they're even saying in these letters. And I've heard of some cases where people have received two letters in the same day, both alleging overpayments, but both letters alleging different amounts of the overpayments. So these things are not easy to unravel at all. And um, it's just, it's, it's almost impossible. You have to send in a letter. Uh, you, you can't talk to someone on the phone and then you have to wait for their response and it'll take them up to 90 days to respond. A big mess. But let me tell you, I have never ran into an overpayment like the one that I saw in the article the other day. Let me pull this up on screen. Oh, it's already on screen. Good. So uh, this is Social Security goes after a man over $122 from 48 years ago. Now, it's not the dollar amount that I find notable here because that's a fairly minuscule amount of money for sure. Um, but the fact is it was 48 years after they made the overpayment to him. And, and I find that to be staggering. I've never heard of a case like that. So he was 67 years old, and he decided it was time to file for Social Security. And when he did, he got this nice letter from the Social Security Administration that said, hey, back in 1973, we overpaid you by $122, which is ridiculous. 1973, as he noted uh, in the article when the columnist was asking him about it, that I can't remember what I did last year, much less 1973. So this is effectively a letter that says, hey, pay it. Uh, we're not going away. You just need to pay this or we're going to withhold it from your benefits. We're going to force you to pay it. Um, now, in this case, he did go to the. Um, he did go to the the one of the uh, journalists here, contacted the administration and they dropped it. But when he called the, the guy that received the letter called, they told him that, no, nope, there is there is absolutely no statute of limitations on this. If we see an overpayment we can collect it. So just a quick warning to you guys here. If you're subject to the windfall elimination provision, if you plan to file before full retirement age, so you're 62 all the way up to whatever your full retirement age is, somewhere between 66 and 67, and you're still working at a job, don't ever think you're getting away with it if the Social Security Administration sends you more money than they should they probably are going to find out about it. A lot of these overpayment cases exist within disability payments. On those, I always say you need to probably get a disability attorney to help you unravel that if they are willing to do that. But overpayments exist for a lot of other things too, like the things we just talked about, the earnings limit, the windfall elimination provision. Uh, there's, there's a few other cases as well. You know, if they miscalculated a survivor benefit, and the interesting thing is, while they're really quick to send you an overpayment notice, there's a lot of people out there that's being underpaid and they're not notifying them when they find out necessarily. And, and if they do notify them, it's just to increase the benefit and not give them all of those years of back pay. So I would just like to say, if that is your situation, if you're on disability and you don't think you're getting the right amount, or if you're under full retirement age, and you still have earnings coming in and you think they may have given you a benefit payment or two too much, um, or if the windfall elimination provision, if you say, well, I thought this was going to apply to me, but I guess they missed it. They probably didn't. They're going to come back down the road and say, you owe them 10, 20, 
$30,000. And if you don't pay it, they'll be glad to start withholding it from your benefit. Now we could talk about what to do if you receive an overpayment notice, uh, but I think that's probably a topic best reserved for another video. With that though, I do want to get out. Um, I want to answer a few of your questions as long as I can. I, uh, I have about half an hour to spend with you today and I want to get in there and answer as many of your questions as I can. So let's jump over to that section and let's see what's going on. Okay. Oh yeah. So um, yeah, I see this one here. One from 30 years ago. Goodness gracious. That's a, that's an old one there. Uh, statute of limitations runs out. They lose period right to federal court. It will be granted. Maybe so. Uh, but they are making the case that they don't have the statute of limitations on this. So, you know, I really don't know. I don't know what the code says on those. Um, Someone said that's crazy. Carrie, I agree with you. That is crazy. Uh, let's see. Perry wants to know, do the statute of limitations or uh, do COLA increases add to your social security payment if you're not collecting? Yes. Yes. Once you're 62, the uh, cost of living adjustments do add to your PIA or your full retirement age benefit, which is then reduced or increased based on your filing age. They absolutely do. Uh, let's see. Yep. Abel says the same thing. They're taking money away from him and that's, that's too bad. I, I hate, I hate hearing those cases because a lot of the people that's getting these overpayment notices, they received a benefit that they, they may have even thought it was correct. I mean, who can unravel any of this stuff, right? You get your benefits estimate, it says you're going to get this and then you might get a little bit more or, Maybe it should have been reduced and it wasn't and you're actually getting the amount that was on your benefits estimate. Well, that's pretty tough. You know, how do you know that that's right or wrong? And then you receive this overpayment notice and yeah, it's a, it's a tough deal. Let's see. You got an overpayment notice in the mail. Uh, David Smith. I'm sorry to hear that. $20,000. That's a lot of money. The first thing you want to do is you want to send them a letter. In fact, I have an article that I wrote on this. If you'll just go to socialsecurityintelligence.com and in the search box, you'll see it on the right-hand side. Just look at overpayment notice. And I give you the step-by-step -step instructions that you need to follow there if, if you've been given an overpayment notice. They typically will give you a 60-day period to respond or they're just going to start to withhold it. Uh, but if you'll do it within 30 days, they won't start uh, 60 days you have a 60 day right to appeal that. And then if you respond within 30 days, they won't start to withhold it from your benefit. They'll continue to pay you the same benefit while they are um, going through their due diligence and their process on that. Uh, that's the way it always has been at least. Uh, Daryl says, what do you think our COLA will be? You know, uh, Daryl, I think it's probably going to be in that 5% range. We're going to find out on July 13th, the CPIW is going to be released for June. Now, that's not a month that counts because it's only the third quarter CPIW that counts to determine how much your benefits are going to increase starting next year. So that's going to be, um, you know, the the cost, the consumer price index for July, August, and September. Uh, and those numbers won't start to be reported until... Um, until August because they're a month delayed. But if the things continue the way they are, you're probably going to be looking at around a 5% cost of living adjustment. And I'm sure someone will make the point that, yeah, Devin, but if, if we see that kind of cost of living adjustment, then we're probably going to see, uh, you know, the value of our dollar erode at least that amount as well. And, and that's accurate. You know, if inflation is up, it's going to take more dollars to buy that. But that's the whole point of a cost of living adjustment. You know, it's, it's not just, putting more dollars in your pocket so you can spend more. It's because things are costing more. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sad I can't work at 62 without it affecting my benefits. Yeah, you know, so it used to be that the earnings limit, the earnings limit used to apply at all ages. 
And it's been fairly recent. Well, I say recent. I mean, we're, we're talking decades at this point, but that it's been moved back to where it stopped affecting people at full retirement age. So the earnings limit only applies from early retirement through full retirement age. That may not make you feel any better, but that's uh, that's kind of the way that works now. It's not, um, you know, it's easy to look at it and think, well, wait a minute, that's, that's a benefit that I have coming to me. Why can't I just get it? Um, and I, I understand that sentiment as well. Let's see. Um, 5%. Somebody said, really, 5%? We need that? Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of what we're expecting, 5% on the COLA. And, uh, you know, hey, hoping we see that. We've uh, we've had enough years with zeros, that's for sure. And uh, because of the way it's calculated, sometimes it's, it's um, you know, just those three months. You can see inflation in the first part of the year. And then you get to those that three month period, that third quarter, and maybe the inflation numbers don't give you a good reading. And so, you know, it, it skews it sometimes. And, you know, I'm sure there's a rationale behind why they don't do it year over year for the full calendar year. I, I don't know exactly what it is. And uh, Marshall makes the comment that uh, most of it will go to Medicare because when they increase your benefit, uh, it goes to Medicare. Now, we don't know yet what the Medicare increase is going to be for sure. We're not going to know that for a while, uh, but it, it doesn't do that every year. So it's easy to think that, that all of the colas get eaten up by the Medicare increases, but I've gone back and I've looked at those numbers and they don't. There are some years where that Medicare, um, the Medicare supplement, the part B and the part D premiums do increase, but it's not every year where they increase by the same amount. So, and two, it's all relative to the amount of benefits that you receive as well. Uh, let's see. Is there a limit to what they can withhold? Um, no, there is not. In fact, they can, they can up to stopping your benefit completely until it's repaid, which I think is probably their default option unless you make a repayment arrangement with them. They'll just say, um, they'll just say you... We're not going to pay it. All right. So I see a couple of people saying that they got skipped in the questions and I'm not trying to skip anyone. I promise you don't get mad at me, but it's just me sitting at this desk. We've got 228 people in the stream right now and the questions are piling in and I'm trying to answer those, but, uh, but they're going through there pretty quick. So I don't know if I skip some of you, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try to come back. I haven't been able to do many live streams until now. I just haven't had the the ability to be able to sit down and do a live stream quickly and easily where I could plug and play and uh, with, with everything else that we've got going, the investment management practice and all of the other videos. It's just a it's just a busy life. So when I get a chance to do these live streams, it's got to be where I can just sit down, turn the lights on and roll. Uh, but I plan to do more of these now. We're in a brand new studio. If uh, some of you have probably noticed that, that um, we are. Not in the old space. We're in a brand new space. So we're uh, really happy about that. We have a lot of new equipment in here. Hopefully it looks a little better than uh, it did before. So let's see what else we have. Uh, too many of us. Uh, too many of us on the live stream. I guess you're talking about Pamela. Well, there can never be too many of you. But, uh, you know, it's just going to be, it's going to be impossible, you know, when we have two or 300. If I do these at six or seven o'clock in the evenings, we'll have five or 600 in here. And, uh, you know, that means that I have to get other people in here to help me. And that's my, my time, which is central. It's just, it's very difficult to be able to sort through all of the people. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sue Dillard. Let me answer your question real quick. My late husband died at 42. I'm very sorry about that. I will turn 60 in January. Any reason I should wait to collect Social Security benefits until I'm 62? Sue, I want you to remember that for survivor benefits, you can still utilize the switching strategies, which means that you can file for your own benefit and then switch to a survivor's benefit, or you can do that vice versa. That option ended for everyone else, but it did not end for those who are entitled to survivor's benefits. So I want you to remember that when you're looking at your benefit amounts, 
you need to make a determination about which one would be better. Your own benefit, which you're eligible for at 62, not 60, like you are the survivor's benefit, it's going to grow. And it's going to grow all the way up until 70. So if it's if it's close to that survivor's benefit, it could be advantageous for you to file for the survivor's benefit now and then let your own benefit grow till 70 and then switch over. It's all contingent on what the numbers look like. That may not make sense for you, but it's something that you need to at least make sure of. Okay. Uh, Frenchy Mama said, we appreciate you. You're doing your best. Well, thank you so much. And uh, let's see. Any news on Social Security reform? No. No, I, I haven't seen anything come out on that. You know, um, when President Biden was running for office, there was there was a lot of uh, information on his website about Social Security reform and what he planned to do. And so far, we haven't heard any of that coming up yet. It could be one of his initiatives he plans to address later, but um, no, we, we haven't heard any substantial talk about reforming the program. So uh, it looks like we're just kicking it down the road a little bit. Okay. At what age can I retire with full benefits? I was born in 1961. So anyone that's born after 1960 or 1960 or later, full retirement age is 67. So, you know, full benefits, that'll be age 67. If you're wanting to collect the maximum benefits, that'll be age 70, at which point your full retirement age will have grown by 8% per year, 124%, and, um, you know, be substantially higher at that point. Okay, retirement age from 67 to 62. Um, so, yeah, you know, they've, they've talked about changing the eligibility age, but if they do, those reductions are going to continue to decrease or increase as well. So if you file right now, if you file at 63 versus 65, there's a 5% difference. So the question is, okay, if you're getting 70% of your full retirement age benefit at 62, would you be willing to get 65% of that at 61? Would you be willing to get 60% at 60? And, and how far down that road would you be able to go? And they're just not going to allow that to happen because they understand that if they do that, they're going to have people filing really early, which is going to impoverish a lot of seniors. And then the needs-based programs are going to have a greater demand placed on them. All right. So 1959, uh, Connie Pitts asked me about 1959. Uh, so I'm assuming, Connie, that's full retirement age for 1959. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> mercy. 66 and 10 months. I'm getting choked up. Let me uh, let me get a drink. This is not moonshine, I promise. It's water. Just water. Let's see. Um, Donald said, I'm 66 and four months old. Is there any benefit um, for me to wait longer to retire? Will it be okay just to do it now? Oh, Donald, that is the big question. Who knows? If you look down in the description of, it should be on my live stream videos as well. There is a workshop that I put on. It's an on-demand workshop. You can go watch this anytime and it's how to identify the right age to file for social security. And I want you to go watch that because I walk through multiple factors that you need to see um, and think about when you are uh, thinking about filing for social security, for sure. Uh, Red Rider said, explain GPO. Oh, we just don't have enough time here. Now, let me tell you though, the windfall elimination provision and government pension offset those are two things that I do enjoy talking about. And maybe I just need to have a live stream specifically for those and just answer questions for those as long as they keep coming at me because I do enjoy talking about those. Let me give you the rough version of it. If you have a pension from a government employer where you did not pay Social Security tax, okay, that, that pension amount that you earn from that employer 
is going to reduce any spousal or survivor benefit that you receive from Social Security in an amount equal to two thirds of your pension. So that's it in a nutshell. And uh, RG said, moonshine. Ha, no, too early for moonshine. Let's see. Um, someone said, I may not qualify for social security disability. Uh, putting the application as, as illness, do not qualify. Listen, let me make a recommendation here. If you're filing for disability and you're having some trouble in qualifying, um, you, you need to contact an attorney or a disability advocate. There's some really good advocates out there as well. But listen, these social security disability attorneys, this system is stacked in the favor of them being able to get your information through. That's just all there is to it. I'm not, you know, I'm not casting stones at them or that little industry that they've built over there, but the administrative law judges and the stats are out there where, you know, if you look at, an individual's capacity to get through to the um, the approval. I mean, the first time it's almost nothing, and then once they hire an attorney, those chances go way up. Now, there's a few reasons for that. It could be because they have an attorney working on their behalf, and it also could be that this is the second go around, and attorneys generally will only take cases they think they can win. So there's a number of things there that it could be. But um, if, if you think you qualify for disability, you need to get in touch with an attorney or, you know, even if you don't know, you need to get in touch with an attorney because they'll be able to they'll be able to tell you pretty quickly. Yes, I think we can get you qualified for disability. They'll warn you. It may take a while, but I think we can get it done. So contact one and be sure to talk to an attorney who does Social Security disability and not the guy who does divorces and car wrecks. It's a pretty complex program. Uh, relationships go a long way in that business. So you do want to, um, you do want to work with someone who that's what they do. Perfect. Uh, and my camera just turned off and back on. I have no idea why. Awesome. Okay. Uh, the year 1955 is the same as 1959. And, um, I'm assuming you're talking about full retirement age there. So no, it's not. Uh, 1955 is 66 and two months. 1959 is 66 and 10 months. I know two and 10 can sound a lot uh, like the same thing when it's coming out of my mouth, especially. Uh, but no, they are not the same. Also, I'm on Social Security Disability. Will it automatically switch over to Social Security? Uh, and by that, Social Security Retirement Benefits. And yes, it will at your full retirement age those will automatically convert over to retirement benefits. No question. Okay. Uh, let's see. And uh, Christina Darke made the uh, astute observation. They almost always deny first time uh, with attorney, but will approve the second time. And uh, yeah, that's, that's just the way it works. That's the way the system is stacked up. Okay, uh, is military service considered a government employee regarding government pension offset? No, not not in recent history. It's not. I believe it was 1983. May have that year wrong. I'm not positive. When um, military service members started paying into Social Security, and so if it was uh, after that, then then no, you're not collecting a government pension that will trigger those rules. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Uh, Dave Johnson said, just got a letter from Social Security, said I made too much money, even though I started September 20th at 65. They only looked at year-long wages, not the six months. You know, so there is the, um, there is the year for the, the, the rule for the first year of retirement. They refer to it as a grace year. And in that year, there is a monthly income limit. So you need to be able to make your case. Again, this is, you know, I'm going to recommend you go to my website, socialsecurityintelligence.com. In the search box, type in monthly income limit. I believe that's what it is. And I have an entire article where I break that down. Also right here on YouTube, I did a video 
that breaks down the monthly income limit. The only thing is on the blog, I actually have links that you can click on real easily that will take you right to the Social Security rules where they talk about um, the monthly income limit, when it's triggered and exactly how it works. But I lay it all out for you there in the uh, in the website. So I would uh, go to that, get started there. Okay, uh, let's see. What will they do? You were under the limit. Yeah, so uh, Dave, maybe a, just get started there. I think the, the format of what we have here, unfortunately, just isn't, uh, isn't long enough. It sounds like that you were under the limit, under the total annual limit. And uh, if so, that ought to be a pretty open and shut case for you. There shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a problem. That doesn't mean they're not going to inquire, though, uh, because some people, some people do get, uh, some people at the administration will get confused sometimes. Okay. Anything else, guys? I'm seeing, uh, I think maybe I should go back through all of my questions, but we are getting right up against the clock anyway. So I uh, hope, hope I was able to answer some of your questions. I know I didn't get to spend a lot of time here, but uh, hey, we'll do this again without a doubt. And whatever the case, watch those overpayments. You don't want them coming back nearly 50 years later saying that you owe money. In the case of the guy we were talking about, it was only $122, but you sure wouldn't want them coming back. And uh, now they're not going to come back 50 years later, obviously. If they do for a retirement benefit, you've probably just set a record for longevity and uh, you're you're alive when, when most people aren't. So uh, you know what? Maybe just, maybe just, pay it if you're 120 years old and, and you're uh, you're getting an overpayment notice. But in this case, it was a child's benefit. And uh, I would just tell you, though, watch those overpayments because it's more than more than just child's benefit, more than just the earnings limit issues. There's a lot of reasons you can get those and they are not fun to unravel. So watch it. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Have a great evening.